um, I guess we'll just start off by welcoming everybody to the panel today. On behalf of uh, CIM and DIAC, we're very pleased to have you uh, join us and also very, very uh, honored to have, have our participants here. Um, we've got uh, four participants uh, in the panel who I actually know personally, which is great. And I'll, uh, I'll introduce them in a minute, but uh, before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge that um, I'm here from Treaty 10 territory in Northeastern Saskatchewan, the traditional lands of the Rocky Cree and uh, home of Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation. So, um, and welcome everyone. And just, uh, I, I think it's very important that, uh, you know, moving forward, talking about diversity and inclusion and stuff like that, that uh, people, you know, just be encouraged to uh, look at where they live, where they work, and uh, consider, you know, whose lands they are on as well. Um, it was kind of a, and just a side note, it was, it was quite the chore when I, I made the ladies and gentlemen do that this past year when we participated in, in West Virginia, because it is hard to find sometimes. So I encourage you guys to do that as well. Um, I'm uh, just going to introduce myself. My name is Carrie Lentowitz. I am a consultant and safety trainer. I've worked in the mining industry now for 20 years, aging myself, but uh, I love the mining industry, um, but it really brought me into the field of mine rescue, which is my passion area. I do training in that as well. Um, and I've been involved in mine rescue since 2006 and have participated in nine competitions as a competitor and several others as judge um, and uh, casualty, which is probably one of my favorites. I can be quite uh, theatrical. Um, the, the, uh, uh, I, I worked uh, in the uranium industry, hard, um, other hard rock as well. And uh, I just absolutely love everything about it. And uh, we're moving forward in, in areas that I'm passionate about, which is uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, it's one of the reasons that I started uh, Diamonds in the Rough Emergency Mine Rescue Organization. And we have a couple participants here with us that have participated in past competitions with us and training camps. And uh, we'll probably talk about that a little bit more, but uh, we're always looking for support. So uh, please look it up. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, our young gentleman here, uh, Ken Warbeck. Ken, uh, I, I've known him for quite some time now. He started his mining career in 89. Um, at the Lanigan Potash Mine as a construction operator. And then in 1991, he was actually certified as a mine rescue worker, and he's still very active in the field of mine rescue today. He's an active member, and uh, he sits on the SMA, Saskatchewan Mining Association. And uh, he's, always in, he's always there whenever I'm at a competition, it seems. You can't get rid of him. <laughs> In 2003, he made the transition from operations to safety su supervisor. And at that time, that's when he became a mine rescue instructor. Uh, he spent 18 years in the potash, potash industry and then moved to the MacArthur River operation and uh, in the role of safety, but also as mine rescue instructor. And then in 2018, he started his career with SSR mining at CB, where he still currently works as the safety superintendent and still an active instructor. You just can't quit, hey? Once it's in your blood, it's there. Um, he's contributed quite a bit to Provincial Mine Rescue Program um, and uh, Industrial Fire and Rescue Competition, West, National Western Regional Mine Rescue Competitions. And uh, he's also been a very, uh, very vocal supporter for Diamonds in the Rough. So he's a great ally to have. Um, Colleen, if you could just wave your hand so we know which one you are. Um, Colleen Parkin Kempton, she uh, lives in Saskatchewan. She is a little powerhouse. I wouldn't say she's little, she's just a powerhouse of a woman. Uh, she's employed at a potash mine near Langenberg, and she started as a contracted employee and then hired on as a laborer. And then she ended up in the mill operations and became a master mill operator by the end of it all, which does not surprise me. She was recently accepted into a four-year electrical apprenticeship program and is in year two, and she's working underground in the minor rebuild shop, um, and she will be attending trade school shortly in May of this year, I believe. 
So she became a member of the Surface Emergency Mine Rescue Team in 2017, and then in 2019 joined the underground one. Now, she, uh, she was one of the first, she says, hybrid members, um, because she was in both surface and underground. And with that, she was able to compete in both surface and underground competitions, both in-house provincial. She was the member of the winning team at the National Western, Mine, Western Regional Mine Rescue Competition. Why do they make that so long? They should trim that down. In Fernie in 2019. And so proud of her last year. She participated at internationals in West Virginia and her team came in second. And I found out they came in second before they did. <laughs> I, I phoned her uh, her mine rescue instructor as soon as I found out, I was like, congratulations. He's like, oh, thanks. <laughs> but uh, I was so proud of your team and, and you. Um, she spends a, a lot of time outside and she's also very theatrical. Um, she was just in a recent community production, um, which I wish I could have come down and seen. Um, Naomi, uh, wave your hand there. So, you know what? I still don't know how to say her last name, but Naomi Stumberg, right? Yeah, Stumberg. 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 Okay. Yeah. okay. She's a senior coordinator for safety, health, environment, radiation, and quality at uh, Cameco's Rabbit Lake Operation in Northern Saskatchewan. It's a long title. That's why they usually say Shrek, right? Ah, it's always so long. Uh, she currently oversees the emergency response program and is an active member and instructor for emergency response and the mine rescue team. She's competed provincia provincially and also internationally as one of our diamonds in the rough in Russia in 2018. And uh, she, she helped make my dream come true. So, hey, thank you. Um, she's very passionate about mine rescue and emergency response and actually also participates in her local uh, Dundurn Fire Department at home. Now, last but not least, Jamie Abels. She's an engineer in training. She's the one that looks like she's still at work right now. And she has a huge passion for mine re rescue and technical knowledge. And she is a field, field engineer in under, the underground mining industry. She became certified in 2018 and uh, became an active member right away and promptly joined Diamonds in the Rough very last minute. And we threw her on a, a basket and she was like a deer in headlights, like, what the heck am I here for? But uh, she did fantastic. And in that uh, National Western Regional Mine Rescue Competition in 2019, she was part of the team that came second in first aid. So very proud of her. Uh, she has a lot of technical knowledge and she likes to work hands on and is very innovative and uh, so engineering field seems very, very suiting for her. And she has worked in a, on a lot of different projects from startup to full production and uh, she is a huge, huge supporter of uh, Mine Rescue, Diamonds in the Rough and I have like, how old were you when we um, when we first met. I believe I was only 21 or 22. Yeah. yeah. And I've just seen her confidence go through the roof since since we first met. And uh, yeah, she's definitely going to be, well, she is a leader in her, in her roles now. So it's great to have you guys here. Now we're gonna proceed with asking some questions here as soon as I find them on my screen. Thankfully my screen is big, but it means lots of windows are open, but uh, um, so one of the things that I wanted to ask your opinion on is how what what are some of the biggest challenges you see that we're facing to getting more a more diverse participation in mine rescue? Um, and maybe I'll start with you, Naomi. I think the challenge. Well, I can only speak to Northern Saskatchewan in the uranium industry, but I find the challenge is not just attracting to the mine rescue team, but just hiring in the first place to get the right candidates, like to have people that are safe for me, have a young family at home, whether it's male or female, to have those people hired at site so we have that pool to pick from. Like I find that sometimes we're recruiting for mine rescue and it's limited who we have to pick from just based on yeah. our work location and our schedule. I find that's really tough. Yeah. Jamie, as an 
up and comer, very new to the industry. I don't know why my phone is ringing. It's on silent mode. <laughs> um, as an up and comer, what, what do you see right now? Being I'm already coming into this industry as more of a minority group is very intimidating. And trying to get the confidence to step into these specialized roles is not exactly encouraged. And as much as it is supported to get that confidence to ask to join or be asked to join yourself is a big challenge. Yeah. I guess, I guess knowing, knowing that, what do you think, what types of things can uh, people in the mining industry do to encourage those that might not be, you know, loud, loud mouth like me, I guess, and say, hey, I want to join. How can we maybe foster that inclusion a little bit better? I think definitely opening the pool of who we talk to about it. Traditionally, it is underground roles with underground miners specifically as it goes to those people but I think if they did more presentations on what mine rescue was what it entailed what you could contribute and where you could excel it would definitely be encouraged a lot more mm -hmm. and a lot more interest would be brought forward yeah Colleen what about yourself what kind of challenges do you think there is or have you seen experienced um I agree with Jamie and Naomi and I think a lot of it is strictly people are intimidated by what they think mine rescue is or surface rescue is and they probably think that they don't have enough to offer or don't meet the sort of guidelines people have in their head and I think the best thing to do is keep having in-house competitions and inviting people to come and see and having open houses and just communicating you know diamonds in the rough like people knowing that these things are out there existing and that they can watch them I think are great steps into getting people joining what about you Ken what have you seen um you know from from your perspective um you know we, we've been in this for a while uh what have you seen that um that has been a challenge that maybe has been overcome in in inclusion so I uh, go back to my start of my career in mine rescue. Probably the biggest challenge was that there was not a lot of turnover. Um, I find, that, and maybe you'll disagree or agree, but in the potash industry, when you get into the into the mine rescue program, you're almost like a lifer. You're you're there till you just can't do it anymore. So there's not a lot of opportunities to step in somebody else. Um, so whether or not it's it no matter what you are or what background you have, it's it's just waiting in a list for an opening to occur. I, I didn't find as well, though, as I moved up north. So both when I was in the uranium industry as well as here, we have a lot more turnover, uh, a lot more fresh people coming through our program that uh, whether they get into it, uh, they move on to a different employment opportunity, or they just decide, you know what, uh, this isn't for me. The I almost find that as an opportunity for more inclusion because we are going through so many people, we have so many opportunities. We're, we're trying to keep 60 active members on our site because we have no no road access. We are. We want to be an island. We want to be completely self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. And with a crew of around 500 employees, we're over 10% of our employees staff. We're digging into every pool of people that we have. So we actually look at it as almost a little bit of an opportunity by building such a large program or trying to keep that large of a program and keeping other, you know, anybody that's got any interest at all, come on in, we'll bring you in. We, uh, one of our more recent safety people when they were here, he, he's another one that just left us though. Um, during the competition, he was out videotaping. He took all the little snippets. We have a TV that runs around the kitchen, the admin building. They're running that video constantly trying to generate interest. This is, this is, is this for you? It's fun. It's, it's exciting. And you're going to take some skills home. They're going to help you take it home and help your family. These are things that we're trying to really promote to try and get that awareness up. What about yourself, Naomi? What are some of the things that, uh, that could be done to overcome some of the challenges you talked about? Well, I agree with Ken. I think it's like that advertising it and things like the SMA competition, I think are great advertisements for what it is. And people don't necessarily get a taste of that in Saskatoon very often. So I think things like that really help. And then at site, well, I in care and maintenance, especially, I find that it's sadly going to be, you're voluntold to be on this team. But what's actually happened is people are on the team and then they're welcoming others onto the team because 
yes, there was the necessity, but then it surprises you who is the diamond in the rough, you know, the ones that come on board that maybe they never would have before. And I find that they're drawing more people in just from being on the team. Yeah, no, that's great. Now, Ken, just listening to some of the other suggestions um, and some of the other recommendations, I guess, um, one of the things that was mentioned by Jamie that I thought was, was interesting too is actually going and actively basically grabbing somebody and saying, hey, we want you, right? Is that something that you guys do as well? Like basically- We do, we, we do. We start usually fairly uh, on broad perspective at it where we'll, we'll attend a crew lineup or a safety meeting and, and really just, hey, look, at, we're looking for more people, anybody that wants to get on, we have a sign up sheet. Uh, and then further to that, if we get some of our uh, you know, senior leadership team, we'll see somebody that is that person that looks like a, a potential leader or somebody that's going to really, they want to they want to be able to have us bring out what skill set they may have. They'll come up to us and ask us, you know what, I think this is one that you should go really dig after. And, and uh, it, we've, we've had some good success that way. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, I, uh, I know when I joined, it was like, you can't, you, you can't keep me away from it. Like, I, I think it was kind of bullying Bruce when I joined. But um, when you're involved in mine rescue, sometimes it's surprising when people don't want to be, <laughs> you know, but I, I think you guys all brought up some good points that it, is, it can be quite intimidating to some people. And I, I think I've seen that in, in a lot of the competitions, just people even going to a competition, if they've been involved in mine rescue for years, they get intimidated by that, right? So um, now what, uh, what have you guys seen, I guess, um, and, and Jamie, it'd be interesting to start with you with this. What have you seen in diversity in the mine rescuers? Like, have you seen a change just in the short time that you've been a mine rescuer? Have you seen a, a more diverse, um, group of people joining teams or is it pretty stagnant? What do you think? I think it was very fortunate before I started in my rescue being at UBC as our team. My first competition, we had an all female team. So I was thrown right into the diversity. A lot of strong women leaders showing me what was possible. When I joined my first active team at Mindsight, I suddenly went to being the only female with one or two others on the team who were gaining very strong leaders. I think over the last, I'd say, four years, I've definitely seen an increase where starting from the entry level, women are expressing an interest in it. They're seeing leaders in mine rescue and realizing that from as soon as they start mining, they have this opportunity. So it's definitely increasing. Yeah. What about yourself, Ken? How well, is it I, since 20, 20 or uh, 1989? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I see a humongous change. I mean, we've gone from uh, provincial competitions where, I mean, I used to watch this, the struggle's always been real. We, my first provincial was in Estevan in 91, I think it was. And the facility they had for lockup was the curling rink. So lots of room for the people, but washing facilities, they had one each. And it was, it was kind of, Hilarious that I mean it didn't matter you're nervous you had your night your Friday night supper and you everybody's kind of choking down all the nerves and uh, it didn't matter if you needed to or not when you got out of the washroom from from the male perspective you ended up going right back in line because you're going to need it by the time you get to the front again where <laughs> I think there was possibly one maybe two women on the teams at that time and I mean it was definitely different uh, last year I think you were standing beside me Carrie you were taking names. I, you'll have to correct me, you'll, you'll have better knowledge than I do, but I don't recall if there was maybe only two teams didn't have at least one, mm -hmm. uh, one member that you were going to approach for becoming a future yeah. diamond in the rough. So yeah. it certainly has changed. It's gotten a lot more inclusive. Yeah, absolutely. It has. Um, and, and Naomi, just in your experience, you work in a, in a, a different demographic up north as well, because you've got a, a high First Nations population there as well. Um, and then uh, it's, it's a mishmash of ethnicities from what I experienced at Cigar Lake. And uh, what are you seeing uh, diversity wise? Well, yeah, you've worked at Cigar, you know what it's like in the North and it's been a push for years for people from like the Athabasca Basin and things like that. So I think that that we were actually 
doing very well as a company for in inclusion on that aspect. And then the women aspect started to pick up and it's improving. And now I see it's across the board because we're attracting people from all over the place. So different ethnicities are part of the site and mine rescue. And again, we're in care maintenance. So some of all telling people, <laughs> but there's also a lot of people that are putting their hand up to join or we're making it part of interview processes as well that we talk about the, the team on site and that that is an opportunity for them if they come to site. And some people are excited about that, some not so much, but it's surprising who puts their hand up to be on the team. And I think it's made it a lot more diverse. I think that's a really good idea is to, is to make that part of every interview process because you're getting them before they even get their foot in the door, right? At least piquing oh, yeah. their interest, right? Yeah, so. so you're communicating that that's a very important part of the site and that they're welcome to join. It's the focus from a management level all the way down. Yeah, that's awesome. Colleen, what about yourself? Have you seen a change in, in diversity within, within the field since your start? Yeah, definitely. The year I joined, I was the only woman surface underground, only woman at all. And now there's I think there's almost 10 of us between surface teams and the underground teams. And that's just in like, that's in less than a decade. Yeah. So it's really, really great to see. And then same with, like I mentioned when I was messaging back and forth with you, we have a man that was born in Tibet now has joined our underground team. Right on. And we've got a Ukrainian on our surface team and a German on this team. And it is becoming very diverse. It's really great to see. Yeah. Um, I, I know when I, in 2007, I was, uh, and for the next, I think four times I competed, I was the only female competing in the underground competition. And I think I was one of the first. Um, and uh, I was the first female mine rescue instructor. Now we've got a lot more, which is great. Naomi's one of them. And uh, our provincial mine rescue coordinator is also female now. So, so that's, that's great to have that diversity because um, I mean, if you look at the stats, uh, the more diverse the workforce, and I'm not saying just increase in women, but um, all ethnicities, cultures, you name it, uh, the safer we are. And it's, it's better for the bottom line as well, right? So uh, a safer workplace is a more productive one. So now when you look at the resources that we have in Mine Rescue, whether the equipment, PPE, are we actually in mine rescue modeling best practices out there or are there changes that are warranted? We'll go with who haven't I picked on in a while? Naomi, <laughs> we'll continue with you. Sure, uh, we, we've chatted a bit about this already, but the, the coveralls just that fit every shape and size, women, men, and in between. And then the equipment, like personally, I would like to have better harnesses on the different SCBAs, whether it's a dragger or a bio, I find everybody has their own struggles with it for different shapes and sizes. So whether it's a obese middle-aged man or it's a petite little girl, it, they don't have a lot of movement within the harnesses. It's one of my beefs. I know it is on our teams too. Um, those would be the main things yeah. I can think of. Have you tried on the new Pro Air? Dragger Pro Air. I can't afford it, but <laughs> I love it. It's so comfortable. Um, <laughs> um, what about yourself, uh, Jamie? In some areas, yes, there's a lot more starting to come out around specific PPE when it comes to footwear, when it comes to gloves, and started in coveralls. But I think when it comes to more like our firefighting gear, our breathing packs, is it's so traditional been for one design for years and years and in the last five years we're starting to get a lot more inclusivity but definitely still a lot needs to be done there when you look at even on websites selection that men have versus women a very direct example a lot still needs to be developed when I was in West Virginia I had to go to seven different stores to get enough of the right kind of gloves for the ladies on the team like it was crazy what, speaking of West Virginia, Colleen, you were there. What did you think about the resources that we had to compete with? Were we following best practice or was there, what would you recommend? Anything? Um, 
me kind of echo Jamie again. And really it's the pack is kind of the worst thing. <laughs> it's not very comfortable. It's one size fits all. Um, West Virginia, otherwise, I don't think I would have any complaints as far as resources or. Yeah, I know. I know one of the things that we had to go and request that they uh, supply more smaller masks because they, they only had one originally. So we had to get them to do that. And some of our ladies uh, that were competing in the rope rescue, they were wearing like large or extra large um, harnesses. So they weren't allowed to go anywhere near the, the hole because it wasn't properly sized for them. So they actually did bring in some smaller ones for us, which was good. But you're right, the, the, types, of, the types and sizes and the fit of equipment is really important. Uh, what about you, Ken? Like some of the, what are some of the things that, that you think we need to improve on with resources or are we following best practices in areas? And if we are, what, what are those, those areas that you think we are? So, yeah, that's such a, with my history going through three different types of mining environments, it's different. So uh, in the potash industry, you, you throw your gear in the back of a Toyota and you can drive across the, the mine and there's no effort or any real rigor involved. And then uh, moving up to, to the uranium industry, well, the mine site that I was at, it was still fairly similar. You could walk it all on foot, um, and, but we had a wheeled stretcher unit to do that. And it really wasn't even that impactful because it was paved roads. And, and I mean, it's really a unique mine to be at. So it really didn't have that much of a, a bearing. But now I get to the one where I'm at now. It's ramp access only. Everything you have to do is manual. So yes, the wheeled stretcher units is one good example of a best practice, being that you can't have anything that's self-propelled unless you're in a you know, unit of power mobile equipment. But at least we have the ability to carry the weight uh, by pushing it along versus carrying it all the way, especially when you're talking about multi-level mines. Yeah. What, anything else to add there, Colleen? Or? Well, I think like, especially for women, it's kind of always a battle for sizing and we just don't have as many options as the men do. Like, to be honest, I've never bought a pair of women's boots because there's never any selection. <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, when one of our competitors, when we went to Russia, we had to go and try and find her size four and a half men's boots uh, with, with uh, tar tarsal guards on them. And that took us a while. <laughs> but when we found them, exactly. they were very cheap because nobody else needed them. <laughs> So that was good, but uh, yeah, there's there there's definitely some some challenges there. Um, one of the things is though we we had that brief chat before uh, we got onto the the uh, meeting here with the rest of the people, but uh, there's companies out there that are actually, you know, where they're seeing a a need, they're actually just building it themselves. You know, and uh, I think one of the things that we can do there, and, and Ken, you, you did that today, you sh shared some information with us for resources. And I think it'd be great when we come across those different types of resources that would accommodate more diverse uh, body types and everything like that, um, if we shared it and created a resource list somewhere so everybody would have access to that. Um, I think it, it, it would be very, very important so we can all move forward together, right? Now, when when we look at uh, women specifically, um, what you know is uh, have you guys participated in an, any type of network for for women in mine rescue to connect or or even all genders, um, n not just in the workplace, I guess. Like any platforms that that you've been on or. I can start this one. Uh, for women specifically, it has been Diamonds in the Rough is the only one that I've been a part of that's only been women in mine rescue and supporting that diversity. Whereas I know in British Columbia here, we have, I believe, one Facebook page across the province that I rarely see used. So it's other than potentially posting updates for provincial competitions, there's nothing unless you have friends that work for neighboring mines or are connected in the industry to get information from. Yeah. What about yourself, Naomi? Um, women in mining, women in nuclear in Saskatchewan would be 
the closest avenue because at least you're connecting to women that are in mining and you can have those conversations but you really have to seek the people out yourself there is nothing specific to mine rescue other than the competitions which i think is where you would network and you'd meet fellow people that's how everybody in this group probably met <laughs> yeah. you start to find liked with like you start to hunt out the other females in the industry so. yeah yeah, it, it's it's very easy with your first competitions to spot the other females out there. That's for sure. <laughs> Usually, yeah, you know, you're going to meet in the bathroom. I mean, it's the only two. <laughs> yeah, it, there's only two stalls, and hey, you know, <laughs> you're sharing them. Uh, yeah, I had my own bathroom for a few years there at the competition. So, uh, yeah. What about yourself, Pauline? Um. So I I've been to the women in mining. I went one year to it and met Naomi there, but she's right. You have to seek out sort of and make those conversations. Um, we were really fortunate in Esther in 2019. We actually hosted, um, it was a women's expo for women to get an opportunity to come out and have a look at the mine rescue gear, have a look at the fire truck and the surface rescue gear. And it was, we had everything left out from our in-house competition. And so we had, you know, both teams had members there to sort of show women, you know, this is how you don your, your bunker gear, and this is how you put on a pack, and let's walk through the problem as though you're on the mine rescue team. And it was a way to encourage women to join in sort of a non-threatening uh, environment. And it was really great and really successful. We had a few people join afterwards. And then, of course, it was COVID in 2020. <laughs> and as all things post-COVID, we're having trouble sort of getting these things up and running again but I think it'll be something we do again in the future yeah I guess so hey um Ken what uh what have you seen that's new out there or what have you found is a great network for mine rescuers over the years really over the years the competition is the key point everybody gets together uh, I mean the networking and the banquet after is huge uh, I don't see it anymore as I'm not on the floor as a competitor. I'm the one that's coming up with the twisted schemes to test everybody. Um, but the, the, even in lockup, so when I used to be there, lockup was huge. You used to go, and it, it wasn't that you were segregated by your own team, by your own table. You'd see somebody you hadn't talked to in over a year and you go over to their table and there's that networking opportunity as well. Um, I would, I would, again, not being in the lockup side of things for a number of years, I'm hoping that that's something that, uh, you know, women in mining get together, look around the tables and, Hey, how are you doing? And, and have you, has anybody talked to you about diamonds in the rough? Is there something that we can do to make this a little bit more, uh, you know, higher value than just today? Let's look at what tomorrow looks like and how we can get more people involved. Yeah. Now what, what, uh, you know, for my benefit, I guess, and, and for, for benefit of others, it, what could our nonprofit diamonds in the rough actually do to, um, to help with that networking? What, like, is there, is there something we could do through social media or maybe at competitions, you know, and, and maybe it's something that uh, CIM could support? Well, even at the SMA, I, I know you reached out in the past and, and I know, I think they, I, I sent you a note a while back now that, uh, that they're looking at opening that up to you a little bit. There's going to be some trade show opportunity. Um, what you've done and you're present, you're at all the competitions, you're, you're putting a team together. Uh, there's no, I don't think there's been a competition in the last number of years, whether it's international or, or local, including the, the northern, the uh, northwestern regional. Um, you're always there and, and you can't have anybody not know what the term diamonds in the rough truly means when you're talking about what the mission statement is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, that's good to hear. It's good to hear that, uh, you know, people, I mean, I like to think that people know about us, but there's still a lot of people who don't. Uh, so, but it's good to know um, that people, people are talking about it um, because it's, uh, I, I think it's a great opportunity for, for women to get involved. And uh, if you guys ever have any suggestions, please let me know. <laughs> But, uh, and if there's suggestions for, for uh, the SIM and, and uh, DIAC, if there's things that we can do there to, to increase those networking opportunities, that'd be great as well. Now, if you had to pick one key area that um, required improvement and what key area a company could implement right now, what would it be? 
thinking of where you're working now or a recent employer, maybe. Colleen. We're not bashing here. We're just saying, okay, here's you're picking on me. <laughs> Um, this is maybe going to sound silly, but my, the first thought that came to my head was bathrooms. Bathrooms are always an issue. It seems like I'm, I don't know if everyone feels that way, but whether it's underground surface, you know, there's four washrooms in the mill for men to use and like two for women. There's buildings on site that only have a men's room. Yeah. Under like underground's underground, right? Obviously that's different, but yeah, it's bathrooms for me is a big one. That yeah. I know lots of people who don't drink water when they go underground because they don't want to use the washrooms. And yeah. And I know there's also people, you know, we're talking about diversity. There's people who would prefer a gender non-specific bathroom. And I'm not sure if we have any of those on site. Yeah. Naomi. Yeah, I would echo that. The not <laughs> wanting to drink water while you're underground. Um <laughs> I think that as a company, well, a good thing is the there's a diversity committee that was started and that's some of the things that were brought up and it is somewhat a slow process, but it, it's also in the construction of new facilities. It has to be planned out at that time. It's hard to retrofit after the fact and especially underground, it's expensive once you start looking at it. So it, it's a, a lot more in the planning phases for sure. It would be nice to have that those elements, the human elements put in earlier on for things like that. Um, but I, I do think the committees themselves are a good step forward, but it would be something further, I think, to join up. There's other initiatives going on in other companies, like kind of like the women in mining, where you yeah. could have the diverse committees across companies starting to share ideas. Because I do find that we kind of get stuck in the mud and we, we don't know how to make progress like there's tons of good ideas well how do you make them work you know sharing yeah. those ideas between companies would be kind of nice yeah. um what you spoke about has been one of my biggest pet peeves the hardwired gender bias that that starts right at the planning phase we had uh, i worked at a site where they were building a, they they had this women's dry and you literally could not fit two women in there at the same time and have them changing um, and so they decided, hey, we're going to expand. So they're like, well, we'll put 20 lockers in this one. Like, Why? And they're like, well, we're never going to have that many women. And I'm like, with that attitude, of course you won't. <laughs> right? You build it for what you want, not what you, you know, you don't build it for worst case scenario. You build it for the best, right? So what about yourself, Ken? I'm hearing a lot about the washrooms and, and I could probably echo that for the underground environment and refuse stations. I mean, it's easy to, you know, develop a quick refuse station, blast some rock, throw in a luggable loo and call it done, but not really much there for privacy for even, doesn't matter who's in there. If you've got more than one person in there, it's, you're, you're really in a, in a pretty public environment. Uh, and then the other thing I think from what I've heard just mostly for this call is the PPE piece. I think if companies really look at trying to you know, whether it's the one you mentioned, Carrie, that somebody's gone out on their own and decided to try and develop their own product, or if you can find a product that's, we're trying to share what we find at trade shows, but if, if that product that I sent out would work for, for yourselves, I mean, it's great to share that out with all the other companies as well. Yeah, absolutely. Jamie. Uh, I think for me, it comes back to PPE as well. I mean, I can give some examples when I was working at none of it. For fire gear, we had one small set, two mediums, and one large. Even that small set was a little bit big for me. The first active underground thing, it was the same. I was up there scrambling to find a set that was the correct size for me. And they just didn't have anything like that available. And it definitely made it difficult to want to continue sometimes when you're always scrambling, digging around, trying to find something that would fit. Yeah. I, I think you'll find that in a lot of emergency response areas as well. I know uh, for uh, my local fire department, it took me two years to get a proper fitting SCBA mask. And I only got it because somebody else left. So, uh, and it, 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 in the municipality, it's a little different because the holdback is the taxpayer money right? It's a little bit of a different different dynamic, but I mean, money is a huge thing in mining too, right? 
anytime you put a safety label on something, the price gets jacked right up. So, so, but, um, you know, when we, we look at safety being our first priority, it is something that we, we need to be realistic about in our budgets. And uh, if, if we want a safer workplace, we know diversity is key to that. So we need to budget for that as well and realize that that's, that's a huge, huge uh, part of, of making sure our, our employees go home safe at the end of each day, right? So um, what do I have here? Now, one of the things that I'm always curious about is what people have seen or experienced in regards to microaggressions. So this can be and like for people who might not be aware of what microaggressions are, they can just be subtle, either intentional or unintentional things that people do, um, like uh, having somebody say, hey, beautiful, when you're walking down the hall at work. Uh, and one way that I approached that in the back was, yeah, would you call your boss beautiful? Well, no, like, then don't call me that either, please. I have a name and uh but there's a lot of little things that go on like that um and I'm curious what what have you what have you seen or experienced and uh if you were able to address it how did you go about doing that Ken well I'm the only example that I can really give is is uh, when you start throwing out names of new incumbents into the program uh, periodically you'll get a name comes across and it doesn't matter who they are what gender they are or what nationality they are sometimes the instructor that you're talking with will possibly say you know what I don't think that's going to work out it's just not going to be a fit and the way that I handled it in my most recent experience was I think you need to go and take that individual build that relationship so that it's not you just saying that this isn't going to work. I asked them to take the person out, uh, bring them to the mine rescue room, throw a pack on, see if they can carry the weight. If they're comfortable with carrying the weight, find three other people, lift the stretcher a little bit, do some surface walk arounds. And then the last step was I wanted them to take them. Our, our mind is somewhat unique in the province that it's, it's a uh, ladder way access in the event that there's smoke coming out of the mine. So I asked them to take that person and go down a few sets of the ladders just to ensure that there's a comfort level. Because I gotta tell you, my first mission here on this site, I was, I, we were doing a drill. It was a scenario we developed to test the system that they said worked. Uh, we went down the ladderways. Uh, I went last uh, because I was fresh to the mine. I wanted to make sure that the other instructor knew how to get out of the ladderway and what level to be at, because it's all just a dark ladder to me. And I, I spent over a couple hours following one very you know, seasoned veteran of our program that all of a sudden was not comfortable just swinging their leg over an open hole and going on a ladder. So that, I mean, that we had somebody that was one of our long-term mine rescue guys that couldn't do it. And I, and I struggled with one of my instructors saying, I don't think she's going to work out. Let's let her go and decide if she wants it. So uh, having them gone out there and actually taken them to the workplace, try a couple ladders, you know what? This was a perfect fit. She wanted to stay in part of our program. Yeah, right on. What about, what about you, Jamie? I think it's been very hard for me to be taken seriously in a lot of it because I do come in so bad. Oh, mine rescue is a huge passion for me, coming in with so much excitement and eagerness. I think a lot of people are like, oh, she's here having fun, especially with my technical background, is they aren't as traditionally involved in mine rescue. I, I just wasn't taken as serious with the, I guess, grunt work of it. So it's not like, oh, she's here to have fun or like just kind of off doing her own thing. So it's difficult to actually sit down, prove myself, go through the grunt work with the guys, climb up to the top of the mill on the stairs and that CBAs and be like, hey, I'm still here. I'm having fun but I'm taking this serious and I'm learning wherever I can. So just yeah. unfortunately came down to proving myself and being like, I'm here to stay is however you treat me, I will still be here at the end. Well, it takes tenacious people like yourself to continue to do that so people can see that, yes, we can do it and we definitely do want to be here, right? So Naomi. I'd echo that you I have to work 
I'd say twice as hard to prove yourself in the beginning because it's just, you're not the norm at the beginning. It's getting better, but you still have, I still have that feeling like you have to prove your, yourself and it's unfortunate, but I think it's just the nature of it that you're, it's not just accepted that you're there, that you kind of have to assert your spot. And that's a really difficult thing for say an introverted person or like, how do you attract those other people? And it's, but I think you need those people with the passion, like you're talking about to pave the way for other people. So that when those aggressions come up, you have people in the room, putting those people in their place. And you also need the instructors to echo that and just back everyone up so that it's not accepted anymore to have those microaggressions or the singling out of people, not just women, but other people too. And well, I had to come up last year. I had one of my instructors telling me that this new hire female could not be on the team. And all the reasons were ridiculous because we already had a male that was on the team and all the reasons that were brought up, well, then the male should not have been on the team either because they were essentially in the same position yeah. work-wise. So at least now I'm in a position I can overrule that instructor and make them accountable. But for the longest time, I think that there was a lot of older generations, sorry, Ken, not singling you out, but just to say, <laughs> Ken's been one of the good ones, but there is an older generation still that doesn't truly accept some of those younger females onto teams right off the get-go and the excuses given, you know, a lot of people may back down and say, for, oh, for sure, they aren't qualified. To me, that is a microaggression in a very yeah. inadvertent way. Well, and I think that's where, I mean, Ken's probably changed, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've probably changed your views over the years as well. Um, but you've become, uh, and I, I'm, ever since I've known you, you've always been a strong supporter of, of women in, in Mind Rescue. Um, you don't care, oh, I, I, whatever gender somebody is, you don't care. If they want to be there and they can do the work, you want them there. That's, that's great. I, I mean, I like to see it. If you've got the drive, uh, that's the person I want. If you're in there for the right reason, that's the person I want. I don't want the person, uh, it doesn't matter what gender you are, what background you are. If you're only in there because at the end of the year, you might get a $2,000 bonus because it's an honorarium for you. That's the wrong person for me. Yeah. I want the person that's going to come out. They're going to carry the radio at night. Uh, they're going to they're gonna respond to when the siren goes off in the middle of the night, not sit there and wonder, well, is, do I get overtime for this? I, that's the person that's I'd rather single out people than than try and say I need to include more because I yeah you're right I think that I try and include as many people as we can especially coming from programs that have to be you know fairly large in numbers on northern operations when you are independent of anybody else being able to come in and be a mutual aid just by driving on the highway I mean I envy that right now but at the same time I'm in control of my own destiny and I got a good number of people that we we train in-house we get good quality people out of that training and we can be independent of any other mutual aid right now just because of it. And it's about reaching out and getting all that inclusion. Yeah. And I like to point out that this old guy, this old guy, I think helped train Naomi and brought her up. I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> Ken is one of the advocates that helped me get into it. And the same with like Travis, the instructors were good too. So I was very fortunate that way that I had advocates for me. Yeah. And, you know, uh, we need male allies. We can't do it without male allies. We absolutely cannot. Um, it, you guys are so important. Um, it, it, to admit you need help sucks sometimes, but when somebody speaks up right away and says, no, you, you're doing something wrong, you leave her alone because she's doing better than you, uh, you know, having somebody say that, um, can be, you might be like, back off, I can stand up for myself, but it, it helps. It really does. And we definitely need more allies like that. Um, and uh, sometimes we as women just need to admit sometimes when we do need that support. So Colleen. Yeah, so Jamie and Naomi, like you hit the nail on the head. It's a lot of like self-questioning. Should I be here? Have I earned my spot here? And then now that for myself now that I've kind of moved past that self-doubt I find I get really really frustrated with the micro the microaggression of well why do we need a, why do we need a women's committee where's the men's committee why do we need to recruit women why can't we recruit the men you know those questions really frustrate me and I 
I don't know why it's my job to educate people. <laughs> uh, whenever people ask me that, I say, well, we've had a men's committee since mining has started. So uh, I think it's time we had a woman's, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and I, I think one of the things that we need to express too, and that's one of the things I really try to get across with our, with our organization, Diamonds in the Rough, is we're not there to be better. We're there to show that we, we belong, that we're equally as competent, that we can do the work, we want to do the work. And, uh, you know, we make things better. We do, we contribute, we see things differently. Um, there's environmental uh, factors. There's, you know, how we're raised has a, a big uh, impact on how we, how we approach problems, whether they're, whether, you know, it requires us to think a certain way, be a caregiver. Um, there's a whole bunch of different, different things that we, we bring to the table. Um, I, I mean, yeah, sometimes we're smarter than certain people. We can, no, just kidding. <laughs> Um, but it, it's, it's not about being better. It's about being better together. Right. Um, and I, I, I think that's, that's a big message that we need to get a, across and, and, uh, we want our male counterparts to he hear. We're not trying to show you up. We're trying to lift you up. Right. We're trying to, uh, help you be better at what you do so we can all go home safe at the end of the day, I think. Right. So, yeah. Um, I'm on a very comfortable chair here, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, the, uh, this is a big one, actually, and I guess we kind of just touched on it with the male allies, is the mentorship or sponsorship. Are there gaps in our industry when it comes to mentorship and sponsorship um, of, of minorities, whether it, it's women or people of different, different cultural backgrounds? Um, what do you think, Colleen? we have enough members? Um, I feel very fortunate in my journey that I've had fabulous allies and our team is like a family for me. Um, but I acknowledge it's not like that for everyone. And I'm just, I've been very lucky to have fantastic people locally and then to meet people like you, Carrie and Naomi and Jamie. So I, I don't feel like I can actually answer that. <laughs> I've had nothing but good experiences. That's good. That's great. What about you, Naomi? You, you, uh, you had a very, uh, very positive experience with, with mentorship in, in Mine Rescue at MacArthur, right? From what I understand. I did. Yeah. You have to say that now, right? <laughs> I have to say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't complain. I mean, the the negatives were so few and far between for me that it was always exciting. As far as mentorship, I would say I had it great starting out at MacArthur River where I did. And then on the other side of it, I kind of through the women in mining, I met other women in the industry. And then you kind of seek it out, but you find, you kind of mentor each other unofficially. Like It's just somebody that you can call if you ever want to kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about yourself, Jamie? I think like part of the reason we are all still here and able to talk about it today is that we have had great mentorship throughout our mine rescue careers. And that's why we are still here is because we are fortunate enough for that. And I've definitely found most of the places I've been at have. Some places there just isn't mentorship or sponsorship or support available, whether it's financial, whether it's technical knowledge. That was more of a startup project where it just wasn't available. And when you try and reach out to neighbor mines in Nunavut or the Northwest Territories, is it's challenging to break the company barriers to get that support yeah. and seek that support from people who are experienced and local to you. Yeah. One of the things I've always thought I'd love to see in a company is to have a good mentorship program where every new person had a mentor and it didn't have to be from their department, right? It was just somebody that they could talk to, um, you know, they had to, you know, just get to know each other. So they had somebody that they could, 
they could approach to help them along with different things, whether it was career choices or, or different opportunities in, in the camp life, there's a whole different, <laughs> different aspects that, that come into play there. And I've always thought it would be good, especially in that kind of environment to have a good mentorship program. What have you seen, Ken, out there for, for mentorship? I think the best example of mentorship is when, when you get your uh, competition team selected. And it doesn't matter if you do it by an in-house or if you just do a selection. Once you get that core group of seven team members, uh, it doesn't matter what background you have whatsoever. Each person is mentoring the next. They want to make sure that they gel. They want to develop them. They want to make sure that if they're the one that's stuck doing that independent exam, that they have that answer and they drive each other. And from the mine rescue side of things, I think that time spent together as a cohesive team is where your best mentorship comes from. Sorry, I had to sneeze. <laughs> oh my gosh, the snow mold is out here. Um, yeah, uh, I think that with with uh, mentorship too, it sometimes you know we're all moving moving up um, in our careers or, or moving laterally in our careers, whichever way we choose to go, but we can self-appoint ourselves, right? We can, uh, we see somebody that's struggling, we can go out there. That's when I, I work in a mining town and I have a lot of friends that are, uh, that are um, in, in the mining industry. Most of them are, are male. Um, and uh, I've had a lot of talks with them about what they can do to support women. And one of the biggest challenges they, they said was um, they didn't want to be seen as that, dirty old man if they went and saw uh, went and started talking to one of the women in a form of support right so one of the things that I've encouraged is for I said that's more reason for you to do it right because you're not that dirty old man you can show people what it's like to or how you need to be to treat people properly so right um Ken have you ever experienced that? I actually get blamed more about treating everybody too much the same. <laughs> I mean, really, especially if I'm trying to drive for results and drive for performance when I'm trying to push a new member, uh, it really, it doesn't matter who you are. I'm just really trying to pull what little nugget I can out of you and make you a better yeah. Ryan Rescue person. Yeah, no, and, and that's good. Um, it's... Uh, it's interesting some of the stories that I do hear from some of my male counterparts, um, especially around here. It's it's been uh, tr traditionally a very male dominated in mine rescue where where I live as well, um, and it's been very it's it's only been very recently that uh, women have actually joined mine rescue in the town that I'm in, um, and uh, in a lot of cases they use the whole um, well. You can't have women in mining or in mine rescue because there's not underground. Well, how do we get women underground then, right? If that's your qualification, and then it's like, okay, with the whole theory of of um, you know mutual aid, and them now saying, well, you can't have surface workers. How can you expect another another mine rescuer from another company come and help you in a mine rescue event? if they've never been in your mind either, right? So you practice, you practice the same principles, you, you, you learn the same techniques, you know your stuff inside and out. And as long as you've got somebody that knows the groundwork and or can read a map, you should be able to execute it, right? And address it. It doesn't matter where, where you, whether you work in an office predominantly, as long as you get that training underground. So we know you can actually go underground because there are people who go underground and just can't handle it. But um, you know, it, 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 it's a testament to your, your, your training and your mine rescue program. Um, if, if you can be successful in getting those people from those different areas as well. Um, so it doesn't just have to be, you know, diversity doesn't just have to be men or ethnicities. It could be different, just people from different roles, right? And it 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 uh, it brings a lot to to the program when we've got people who are engineers, who are mechanics. We need we need 
all those people because everybody thinks differently. And uh, when you've got a vast, vast array of, of, of different mindsets, you're going to find um, the best, best solutions to address a problem, I think so. I just wanted to jump in again uh, regarding the mentorship, Carrie. And Naomi, yeah. I don't know if you or Jamie, if you find you do the same thing, but for myself, being the only woman for however many years it was, when we finally had more women join, I am like over the top trying to encourage them and be a mentor for them yeah. just because I don't want to lose them. Right. So yeah. last year when we finally got to have an in-house again and Justine was on a team and Kaylee was on a team the night before, probably the weekend before, actually, I was texting them saying, you've never done a competition. So here's what you need to have in your bag. Like, the guys won't tell you this because they don't know. So here's what you need to prep for. And, and now we've kind of got a great little network with us eight women where we're all like really excited to help each other out. Yeah, I guess that's, that's one of the biggest keys. And I, you know, we talked about what is a key area. I think that is one that can be easily implemented at any company is that mentorship, right? So I think it's, it's, uh, you know, really, a really good segue into uh, basically concluding now. Um, we've we've gone a little bit over time, but um, uh, Annika, if if there's any um, questions I, that can be fielded, we'd be uh, more than happy to uh, take a few minutes if people have time to address those. Uh, yeah. There was a question on whether Diamonds in the Rough will have a booth at Memo in Saskatoon in September. In September. Mm -hmm. I know nothing about it, so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then also wondering if you've contacted mining education programs um, to offer students mine rescue training um, so that they know more about mine rescue when they enter the industry. That's that's something that uh, you know for for my organization and our diamonds and rough are ours and most of us have been involved in it I guess it's some it's everyone's let's be honest um it's we've tried to go into the schools um at the elementary schools and stuff but we haven't actually uh, approached at, at a higher level um but I'm I know at UBC um they've got a great program there where they uh, get students involved that's how Jamie Jamie started her her role there um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, honestly, I'm not well versed in, in what programs are out there that where they've had mine rescue. I don't, Ken, Naomi, do you guys know of any programs or? I can actually speak to this one a little bit at the university okay. level because I was. A oh yeah, you, you participated I, in a bunch of them. Right? I knew one of the dime members, Megan, ended up after I graduated or it might've been before I graduated teaching a course for UBC to get them qualified. And I know University of Alberta just started up their own team in Edmonton pretty in the last two or three years. Um, Laurentian has a team. Queens is in the talks of a team. Is it starting to become a lot more present at the university level for our engineers and technicians out there? And we saw a lot of interest from mining engineering and geological engineering and geo students. So, and I think being university students, they always accept sponsorship, whether it's in the form of financial or training. So it's definitely a great way to be involved. Yeah, that's cool. Naomi? I'm not aware of any, honestly, but I would say that just opening up the doors, even in training to say, hey, we need somebody to be our patient for casualty and getting a few more people involved in the training to at least see what it's about or just welcoming people to, you know, just come to a few training sessions, see if you're interested, there's no obligation. Things like that help a lot for especially newer, maybe yeah. some are only there for an apprenticeship, but just welcoming them to it. It may be something that piques yeah. their interest and in maybe not, but. Yeah. I don't know, Ken, is that something that's ever been done even at an SMA where you've, where they've had, um, you know, even, welcome people from the different uh, engineering programs even that might be going into that field because there's so many mines in Saskatchewan um, if if we've invited them and had stuff for them to try on and try out and show them a little bit about what mine rescue is all about 
There, there was a uh, there was a couple of years that I participated as membership of the SMA. Uh, it was a university level uh, competition, and they held it in Saskatoon actually, and it was very it was low key compared to what we're used to. But it was uh, exposing them to the gear. They threw the gear on. We gave them a very we assembled desks in a in a sort of a maze and within a couple of classrooms. So it was a very miniature ver uh, version of what we do. And it yeah. was the, probably the best example I can give as far as actually getting them involved. And uh, that would be the university level. We went actually further to that. There was a couple of years I also helped participate with the SMA. It was, a, it was like a youth camp. My, uh, it, was a, it was for the Northern communities. We had them all brought into Saskatoon. And there was, uh, they did the electronic simulator for fire extinguishers. We put SCBAs on them and blindfolded them and simulated some smoke and let them go and do a bit of a search and rescue. There was a little bit of an obstacle where they had to drag the stretcher, load it up and then drag it back. And these were all, I want to say, that was a youth camp. So I want to say 13 and under. And it seemed like they all got a lot of a kick out of it, uh, but that kind of fizzled away over the last couple of years, probably since just prior to COVID. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, uh, I was contracting to an organization where we were looking at youth programs like that um, more on the fire side. And I was like, God, I wish there was something like this when I was younger, <laughs> you know, um, there's one out in Ontario, it's for firefighting and it's called Camp Molly. And I've approached them just to see if there's some way I can get involved with that. It's uh, I, look it up. It's, it's pretty awesome. They even uh, actually get tailored uh, bunker gear for, for the girls that participate. I'm like, Oh, I wish, I wish I could get that now, but uh, any other questions? Annika. Other questions in the chat. Pardon? No other questions in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll give everybody just a last uh, chance to, to add their two cents here. Um, and maybe just, you know, where do you see, see mine rescue going with, with diversity? Um, and do you have anything else to add, Ken? We'll start with you. Well, I think what you're doing is fantastic about uh, advertising that and getting getting the awareness out that it is important and being able to be front and center, demonstrating what can be done by, you know, a, a team strictly built out of, you know, the women that want to participate. I think that's great. Um, I think most people in the industry probably think eventually that I'll just quit coming around and stop being involved. <laughs> yeah, I don't see that stopping in the near future. So I'm hoping to see a lot more and, and see how many more teams come up with a good yeah. blend of participants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it, and you're right. It's, it's interesting to see how many more women are, are getting into that. And I think it it's due to mentors like yourself and, uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing because we we appreciate the support and encouragement and uh, you, you're a role model to the other men out there too, right? So they see you supporting us and they're like, well, geez, I better get on board. <laughs> so that's good. What about you, Jamie? I think we're definitely on the right track and through encouraging diversity across every aspect of mining, we're encouraging that in mine rescue as well and through diamonds in the rough. I get asked about my sweater all the time. It's my to talk about. <laughs> Maybe I need to send you a new one. <laughs> yeah. um, it makes it front and center and through good role models, the diamonds and just seeing what the potential of being our mine rescue team is. We yeah. brought really good talk. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad you had a great experience and it's so great to have you there. And uh, we've got, uh, I've got some more questions to ask you offline about diamonds too. So. We'll, we'll have some more discussion about that. Naomi. I agree with Jamie again, <laughs> that really all the mining is changing, but it is just becoming more diverse across the board. And I really see mine rescue teams just reflect that. It's like a subset of it. So I am encouraged to see that. And I think that it's just, this ball is just gonna keep rolling more and more. And with advocates like Ken, and you have those males out there that want to see this as well. Like the more diverse, it's surprising how much your team can do and diamonds for sure there it's a statement that women can be accepted but as i've always said diversity really truly is the best thing because sometimes i just need a man to help me lift something <laughs> you know like i do see that it's a good statement piece and then you have the conversation started and the ball's rolling and we have women out there that are 
confident to keep the ball rolling, but you have a little bit of a network, ever so small, but it's a network. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it, you know, you're, you're a great leader in that area. It's great to see you move, move up in your field and uh, take on a, even more of a leadership role within, within your company. It's, it's awesome to see. And hopefully we'll see you at SMA this year. So, yeah, I'll be there watching. <laughs> okay. I'll be doing something. I don't know yet, but Colleen. Uh, yeah, well, I just, thanks for allowing me to be a part of this. I'm like I said, I was terrified and not sure how much I had to add to it, but I love, I just love that we talk about diversity and that we're, you know, we're all champion, champions of change and we want to keep this going. And, and I think it's just important to keep that conversation in the forefront because we just have to be diligent and work at it. And, you know, in five years, there'll be 16 women on my team and hopefully, and, you know, every team at SMAs will have a woman on them. Yes, absolutely. I think, and I think we're getting close to that now, which is awesome. Um, yeah, it, it'll be fantastic uh, when we see that. And for those of you guys who can't see, I have a dog jumping up against my window right here right now for the last half an hour. It's so funny. Um, she's very distracting. <laughs> Uh, but again, thank you guys for participating and thank you to everybody who, uh, who joined the panel to, um, to hear our discussion and, and participate a little bit with your questions. And if you guys have anything to, uh, to suggest to us on, on what any of us can do, um, you, can, you can get my information on LinkedIn. I know uh, Ken's on LinkedIn as well, Naomi, Jamie. Um, and you can contact Dayak on, on uh, LinkedIn as well. And you can, uh, you can find us everywhere, especially if you Google diamonds in the rough mine rescue, <laughs> you'll, you'll be able to find our contact information. Um, uh, Annika, did you, uh, is there another way to provide information for Dayak and CIM? Uh, no, we'll provide, we'll send out a follow-up email with the okay. recording to everyone who registered and all the contact details. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to talking to you all later. I'm going to go get my dog. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, guys.